Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we feature the report released last week by Physicians for Social Responsibility and International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War on the more than 10,000 projected excess cancer cases caused by radioactive releases from the ongoing Fukushima nuclear disaster. We will hear from Dr. Catherine Thomason, Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility, Dr. Alex Rosen, of the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, Tim Mousseau, Ph.D., researcher into insect and animal mutations at Chernobyl and Fukushima, and Bob Alvarez, who specializes in nuclear disarmament, environmental and energy policies for the Institute for Public Studies. Plus, our popular Numbnuts of the Week feature, Nuclear Reactor Duck and Cover Report, and more honest nuclear information than managed to get on most mainstream media stations, even with the Fukushima 5th anniversary glut of stories. All of this will be coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, March 15, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Starting out in Japan, where last Wednesday, March 9th, A surprise injunction by Japanese courts have ordered Kansai Electric Power Company to shut down its number three and number four reactors at its Takahama facility in Fukui Prefecture. The number three reactor was restarted in January, and number four, which had been scheduled to restart last month, has been delayed repeatedly due to technical problems. The court ruling stated that there are doubts remaining about both the tsunami response and the evacuation plan. The ruling emphasized technical problems regarding the two reactors, including issues concerning an outside power supply source in the event of an emergency. Eileen Miyoko-Smith of Kyoto-based Green Action, an anti-nuclear group, said, This is a huge victory for the safety of children, people with disabilities, and the society and economy of not only the Fukui Kansai region of Japan, but the entire country. New concerns are being voiced in Japan after it was discovered that a significant geological fault line passes right underneath a nuclear plant, and the fault is active. According to a report published by a panel at Japan's Nuclear Regulatory Authority, the fault which passes beneath the Hokuriku Electric Power Company's Shika nuclear power plant in Ishikawa Prefecture, lies directly under the plant's reactor number one, which likely means the reactor will have to be decommissioned. The power company has already submitted an application for a safety inspection, inserting that it's not their fault, or in any case, the fault is not active, to which Nuclear Hot Seat adds, yet. And why risk it? I swear, Japan is in need of its own duck and cover report. This from Kagoshima, where about half of the monitoring posts around an active nuclear power plant are unable to detect the high radiation levels that would spark an immediate evacuation of residents. Of 48 monitoring posts installed within 5 to 30 kilometers of Kyushu Electric Power Company's Sendai facility, 22 can only detect radiation levels of up to 80 microsieverts per hour, which is far lower than the 500 microsieverts per hour that would spark an immediate evacuation. The facility was restarted last year. A Kagoshima prefectural government official said there is, quote, no problem with its monitoring because the government will make a decision on any evacuation based on data from nearby devices that can measure high radiation levels and portable measuring devices can also be used. In other words, government officials will know ahead of time and the rats will be able to leave the ship ahead of everybody else. However, 
Of the 44 portable devices that the prefectural government official mentioned, 30 can measure radiation levels up to only 100 microsieverts per hour. And remember, the level necessary to trigger an evacuation is 500 microsieverts per hour. This is all shades of Gina never met a nuke I didn't like in cover for McCarthy, head of the APA and the woman responsible for the non-functioning RADnet monitors on the west coast of the United States that failed to report any usable statistics on the level of radiation that came to the coast of North America from Fukushima. This story from the Associated Press, the ashes of half a dozen unidentified laborers from Fukushima have ended up at a Buddhist temple in the town of Minamisoma, just north of the crippled nuclear facility. They were simply labeled decontamination troops, and their names are not known. Interestingly, minutes after chatting with some workers in Minamisoma, Associated Press journalists received a call from a city official warning them not to talk to decontamination workers. Meanwhile, local hospital intern Toyoaki Sawano said in a medical magazine last month that workers have developed diabetes, cerebral, and respiratory problems. No word of what government officials have called to tell him. And now... Nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's week. Japan's Olympics minister says he hopes Fukushima Prefecture can host preliminary rounds of baseball and softball at the 2020 Tokyo No Olympics Games. Yes, that's right. Let's expose all the international elite athletes, all of them young and currently in excellent health, to untold amounts of radiation in the soil, the dust, the air, the pollen, the food, and the water. As though that announcement wasn't brain-dead and tone-deaf enough, Minister Toshiaki Endo made his comments on Friday, March 11, the fifth anniversary of the magnitude 9.0 earthquake, followed by the tsunami, all of which worked together to destroy three nuclear reactors at Fukushima Daiichi that went into meltdown and started the process of poisoning the earth in a way that's never going to stop. Same countries around the world that care about the health of their elite young athletes are already considering a total boycott of the games, as are any tourists who care about their longevity and the ability of their chromosomes to reproduce unmutated offspring. Meanwhile, other prefectures in the Fukushima region are already set to host games at the Rugby World Cup in 2019 and first-round soccer matches in the 2020 No Olympics. As is said at the end of the movie Bridge on the River Kwai, madness, madness. And that's why Toshiaki Endo and anybody who gets behind the 2020 No Olympics in Tokyo are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. Kazuya Tarukawa, a farmer in Sukagawa, Fukushima Prefecture, in a recent interview with the Asahi Shinbun recounted how his gratifying life as a farmer drastically changed as of March 11, 2011. He was later thrown in the media spotlight after his father committed suicide in the early stages of the disaster. We will have a link up to the full article, which is very moving, on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 247. We will also have links to articles on the Fukushima nuclear disaster is a serious crime, an interview with Koide Hirokawa, who was previously interviewed as part of our Voices from Japan series on Nuclear Hot Seat number 142 and 194. And there will be a link to a BBC article on the nonprofit Tarachine organization, which runs a radiation lab that was set up by the mothers of Fukushima to measure radiation in the city of Iwaki, which is only 50 kilometers, some 30 miles, down the coast from the nuclear disaster. Tarachine publishes its findings online every month, 
and advises people to avoid foods with high readings as well as the places where they were grown. Over to the U.S., where a new report from the Navy shows that nearly two-thirds of the U.S. Navy ships that assisted in the relief efforts that followed the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster in 2011 are still contaminated with low-level radiation. According to an account in Stars and Stripes, the Navy's 25-ship relief effort, Operation Tomodachi, sent sailors near the coast of Japan to assist the area after a magnitude 9.0 earthquake and subsequent tsunami ravaged Japan and caused a level 7 meltdown at the three reactors at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. The ships have been subject to cleanup efforts since Operation Tomodachi, though 13 Navy and three military sea lift command vessels are still contaminated. Contamination is in the ventilation systems, main engines, and generators. The largest American ship to take part in Operation Tomodachi was the USS Ronald Reagan, which passed through the radiation plume while assisting the relief effort. Several hundred sailors have since fallen ill with various forms of cancer, including leukemia, thyroid cancer, and testicular cancer. Some have had to have organs removed or given birth to babies with birth defects. A class action lawsuit against Tokyo Electric Power Company for not warning the United States government and the USS Reagan about the meltdowns and the radiation plume began with eight plaintiffs among the sailors and is now structured to cover the more than 70,000 military personnel in Japan during the start of the nuclear disaster. The USS Reagan is currently homeported in Yokosuka, Japan, and carries on it a full contingent of sailors who may or may not know that the ship is still contaminated by radiation. Now it's time for the nuclear reactor duck <laughs> and cover report. Excessive salt water from Florida Power and Light's nuclear facility, Turkey Point, is threatening Biscayne Bay and the aquifer that supplies much of Miami's water. Two years ago, FPL upgraded generating capacity at its two Turkey Point nuclear plants south of Miami, and after that, both reactors ran hotter. Because of increased evaporation, Water in the closed network of canals that provide water to cool the plants became saltier and saltier. Now tests by the county confirmed that a plume of hypersaline water has contaminated the aquifer, which provides drinking water for the 2.5 million people who live there. So not all nuclear problems are created by radiation. There's plenty more to go around. <laughs> At Riverbend in Louisiana on January 10th, with the plant in cold shutdown, it appears that inadvertent contact with an energized circuit occurred between the jumper installation, causing a fuse to blow, de-energizing part of the primary isolation logic. There's no logic in nuclear, but this is what they call it. And this caused the automatic closure of valves in the shutdown cooling loop. In other words, they blew a fuse to a really important piece of equipment, this event resulted from the failure to maintain corrective actions in place that were developed after a similar event in 1994. <laughs> and on March 9th, the Watts Bar Unit 2 in Tennessee declared an unusual event. There is nothing more usual than what they call an unusual event at a nuclear reactor in the United States. But they had an unusual event based on a fire that lasted more than 15 minutes. Here's the irony. Unit 2 was currently in shutdown and making preparations for a startup. They don't even have to be in operations to break down and be a danger to us all. And that's this week's Nuclear Hot Seat Duck... <laughs> And cover report. I swear we're going to need an international duck and cover report. In India, the Gujarat nuclear plant shut down after a major water leak in the coolant system of the nuclear reactor. The emergency was declared on March 11, the anniversary of Fukushima, after what is being termed a major heavy water leak. 
Employees were forced to remain sequestered until after their shift ended and were allowed to go home only after they had been counted and accounted for. Of course, officials state that no worker was exposed to radiation and none was released, but that's what they always say, whether it's true or not. So who's to know? In Taipei, Taiwan, a safety mechanism triggered by a high level of feed water shut down one of the two nuclear reactors at the Jinshan nuclear power plant. This happened on Thursday, March 10. The Taiwan Power Company, or Tai Power, said that the exact cause of the incident was still under investigation, while stressing that there had been no radioactive leak. See, they say that every time. In Israel, a three-vehicle collision in the railway area near the country's only nuclear reactor in Dimona caused a train to veer off the tracks, leading to leakage of dangerous toxic substances that were not identified further. Police closed the entire area and prevented people from going out. Government officials have urged the Israeli public in Dimona to stay indoors following the collision. Please don't tell me the announcement also said keep your doors and windows closed and do not go outside unless you absolutely have to. Large numbers of emergency services are currently on scene, and authorities have sealed the area, banning the public and the media from approaching. In this story on nuclear-news.net, posted by Sean McGee, otherwise known online as Sean Arclight, over the course of the past week, the Ringalls nuclear power plant in western Sweden has been releasing a variety of isotopes, including iodine-131, cesium-134 and 137, cobalt-60, beryllium-7, cerium-144, and tellurium-132. According to the Finland Times, huge radioactive cesium was detected in Helsinki. According to McGee, Dr. Ian Farrelly proved that these releases cause leukemia in children and other scientists like Christopher Busby would claim that there would be other health effects from these dense plumes on the population affected. Because the plume was occurring for nearly a week, downwind areas may have been Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, with Finland hit to a lesser degree depending on the wind directions. Another article from nuclear-news.net states that India's Prime Minister Modi is in the grip of the global nuclear salesman. His recent visits to France, Russia, and Japan were all aimed to bring in socioeconomic and scientific development, particularly in the field of atomic energy. Oh, Canada. Radioactive metal from the Fukushima nuclear plant disaster in Japan has been discovered in the Fraser Valley in British Columbia, causing researchers to raise the alarm about the long-term impact of radiation on British Columbia's west coast. A researcher from the Environmental Management Department at Simon Fraser University said that this means that there are still emissions and trans-Pacific air pollution from Fukushima. This is an international issue. Strontium-90 has been found in British Columbia wild salmon. In a letter to the Canadian and U.S. governments last Wednesday, March 9, more than 100 organizations called for dangerous radioactive substances in the Great Lakes Basin to be designated as chemicals of mutual concern. We'll have an interview on this for next week's show. We'll have a link on the website to an article about Saskatchewan's uranium industry and Diné ecology by the Committee for Future Generations based in Saskatchewan. Both government and industry seek to expand uranium mining activities in the name of progress and profit. But the First Nations people here present a different perspective and have grave concerns about the impacts and violation on their territories. And my favorite quote of the week this one sent in to the Nuclear Hot Seat website. It deals with the CNC, which is the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, which is like the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, unfortunately, it seems, in more ways than one. This individual said that members of the CNSC Tribunal have been asked publicly at a public hearing, do any of you live near a functioning nuclear generating station? Apparently, 
None of you do. Does this mean that tribunal members are able to view the possibility of a nuclear accident as merely academic? Good question. No word as to what answer, if any, was given. We'll have the week's featured interviews in just a moment, but first, Nuclear Hot Seat is listener-supported, that would be you guys, and relies on your donations to help keep us going and growing. We have monthly running expenses, website assistance, I'm going to be going after some social media assistance from a real pro pretty soon, and then there are travel expenses when it's important to get me to the stories that need to be covered such as you heard in Nuclear Hot Seat number 244 when I went to St. Louis to cover the Westlake Landfill Cold Water Creek story. So whatever you can do to help us meet our goals, please do what you can. A Starbucks donation is a great way to start. Just buy Nuclear Hot Seat the equivalent of a cup of coffee every month. It's the best cup of coffee neither you nor I will ever drink. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com Click on the big red donate button and know that whatever amount you can offer is deeply appreciated. As always, you have my gratitude. One of the rock solid from now into the future cornerstone pieces of information was released last week. It is a report by Physicians for Social Responsibility and International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War and is entitled... Five Years Living with Fukushima. The report gauges cancer prospects for children, for rescue and recovery workers, and the general population, while criticizing the Japanese government for its disturbing failure to examine wider radiation-related diseases. Last Wednesday, March 9th, PSR and IPPNW held a telepressor press conference, which is a format used for international journalists, and this was both to announce the report and provide access to four of the planet's top experts on various aspects of the nuclear danger. They would be available for individual interviews by reporters. It was a dream team of genuine experts. Interestingly, all of them are former nuclear hot seat interviewees. For fairness sake, on the telepressor call, journalists were limited to one question each with one follow-up question allowed. What follows is the press conference, slightly edited to take out some of the more formal aspects of it, along with the journalistic interaction conducted at the end. It is both an easy-to-follow precy of the health impact of Fukushima and an accurate readout on the media's attention to the impact of this nuclear disaster. First, we hear from Dr. Catherine Thomason, Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility, or PSR. She is also a co-editor of the U.S. version of the report. Thank you. Welcome so much to this news conference being held to release the report, Five Years of Living with Fukushima which is the work of Physicians for Social Responsibility and the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War. On behalf of my organization and our international group, IPPNW, I want to thank you for joining us today. As you'll hear, our report concludes that residents of the Fukushima area and the rest of Japan will experience more than 10 to 66,000 excess cancers as a result of a radiation exposure from the triple reactor meltdown that took place on March 11, 2011. Unfortunately, the full health impact of Fukushima may never be known due to Japan's failure to immediately and fully track radiation releases, as well as a disturbing lack of testing of the general population for radiation-related diseases and other impacts, such as miscarriages, fetal malformations, leukemia, lymphomas, solid tumors, or cardiovascular disease. The massive initial radioactive emissions were not recorded at the time of the triple reactor meltdown, and some radioactive isotopes, including strontium-90, have not been measured at all by the government. Our new report uses the best available science and data to gauge the excess cancer rates among children, rescue and cleanup workers, and the general population of Japan. In addition to the 200,000 Fukushima residents who were evacuated into nearby makeshift camps, 
The exposed include millions of others in Japan as a result of fallout contaminated food, soil, and water. Our next speaker will go through the report's clear findings in more detail. But I want to emphasize that Fukushima is often incorrectly seen as a past event. The reality is that radioactive emissions from the wrecked reactors continue to this day, both periodically into the atmosphere and in the form of 300 tons of leakage each day into the Pacific Ocean. Five years living with Fukushima draws clear and clean conclusions that given the large amount of radiation released, the calculated cancer risk is clear. The report also asks vital questions about the impacts and calls for better study, evaluation, and treatment of those affected. Health problems will not be identified if they're not sought. The problem with radiation is that the average person can't see it, taste it, or smell it, but you can measure it. Some radioactive particles have radiation that penetrate through the skin like an x-ray, such as barium and cesium. So having these particles on the ground or in the air exposes people to radiation that can cause damage to our DNA and our cell proteins. Other particles like iodine-131 or cesium-137 have beta and or alpha radiation, which can be stopped by clothing or alpha radiation by skin. If these particles enter the body, however, when they're inhaled or ingested with contaminated food, then the radiation is able to cause local tissue damage, including damaging our genetic material or even causing cell death, depending on where those particles or elements are in the body. Cesium is exchangeable with potassium, which is found in all our cells and is taken up more avidly by muscle, particularly including cardiac muscle and endocrine tissues. Strontium-90 takes the place of calcium and can be embedded in bones and teeth. The Japanese government attempted to clean up areas that were contaminated by wiping down buildings, gathering up abandoned crops and topsoil so that people could return to their homes, their farms, their jobs, and way of life. But this expensive, over $13.5 billion effort has not been fully effective. There are many areas that cannot be cleaned up, such as forests and the tons of storage needed for the leaves and debris is a very difficult one. Radiation that was deposited on the ground percolates through the soil into groundwater. It can be taken up in food and is then ingested by those living in these areas. People across Japan are concerned as many were also exposed. For example, an area such as the tea plantations in Shizuoka Prefecture, which was 400 kilometers south of Fukushima and 140 kilometers from Tokyo, were so heavily contaminated that the entire harvest was withdrawn from market in 2011. In closing, I would like to say this. The health legacy of Fukushima will haunt Japan for years to come, and it cannot be wished out of existence by cheerleaders for nuclear power. Unfortunately, the pro-nuclear Japanese government and the country's influential nuclear lobby are doing everything in their power to downplay and conceal the effects of the disaster. The high numbers of thyroid cancers are already verified, with 50 additional waiting for surgery in the children of Fukushima Prefecture is astounding. The aim seems to be to ensure the Fukushima file is closed as soon as possible, and the Japanese public returns to a positive view of nuclear power. Does hasty an ill-thought-out rush to re-embrace nuclear power is dangerous to the extent that it sweeps major and very real medical concerns under the rug. Dr. Katherine Thomason of PSR. Next, we hear from Dr. Alex Rosen, a German pediatrician and the Vice Chairman of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, IPPNW. He is also a co-author of the report. As one of the co-authors of the report, I think it is important to realize for everyone that has read this report that obviously five years after the beginning of the nuclear catastrophe in Fukushima, it is not possible to give overall assessment of the health effects that are to be expected. It is much too early for that. And many of the health effects that we will be seeing, we expect in the coming years and decades. We don't pretend to have the better answers, but we do know that we ask some of the better questions, the more critical questions. Questions such as, what actually happened? We know for a fact that through the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster in 2011, 
uh, enormous amounts of radioactivity were released into the environment. We know that foodstuffs were radioactively contaminated as well as water and soil. We know that all of these substances cause cancer, and we know much more about how they do that than we did 30 years ago when Chernobyl happened. We know that the uh, risk of disease, cancer and non-cancerous disease, is proportional to the amount of radiation dose that a person receives. So the question really is, can we calculate this risk, this number of additional cancer cases that will appear due to the Fukushima nuclear catastrophe. And this is what we attempted to do in our report based on the findings, for example, by the WHO, the World Health Organization, or the United Nations. Now, if you take the numbers by the United Nations, they say that the population in Japan was exposed to 48,000 per conceiver. This is a unit describing the amount of, of radiation. And then you can calculate from that that about 10,000 cases of excess cases of cancer will be expected in this population over the lifetime. If you take the WHO data, you come to even higher numbers, between 22 and 66,000 additional cases of cancer. Now, all of these numbers are estimates, and they're not good estimates. They are underestimations because the numbers and the data they're based on comes solely from the nuclear industry. Um, if you look at the radiation doses of the workers in the plant, they come from TEPCO. If you look at the radiation dose of uh, contaminated food, they come from the International Atomic Energy Organization. And if you look at the amount of radiation that was released in total, that comes from the Japanese Atomic Energy Agency. So in our view, these numbers represent the lower spectrum of the estimates, and we expect there to be a much greater number of excess cancer cases. And the same is true for non-cancer diseases, such as cardiovascular diseases. We know from uh, our findings of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors that the risk of contracting cardiovascular disease has about similar risk factors compared to the amount of radiation received as cancer. So we're counting on a similar amount of non-cancer diseases come out of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. What we already see today, five years after the nuclear catastrophe began, is a rise in the amount of thyroid cancers amongst children. We now have 160 children who have to be operated on, meaning that their thyroid had to be removed because of a fast-growing cancer or cancer that had already spread to the lymph nodes and other organs. Usually, this type of cancer is very, very rare in children. In Japan, in the pre-Fukushima era, we had about 0.3 cases of thyroid cancer per 100,000 children per year. So in this population that was evaluated in the Fukushima prefecture, we would expect there to be about one new case per year. So far in the last five years, we have found 116. And what is most worrying is that in 16 of these children, the cancer developed in the last two years. We know this because these children have been screened twice. In the first ultrasound of the thyroid, um, no cancer was found. And in the second one, they found a cancer that had to be operated on. So we're talking about significantly increased rates of new thyroid cancer cases in the last couple of years and expect from our experience from Chernobyl and other incidences of nuclear accidents that the greatest number of thyroid cancer cases is still to come. Based on the data of the United Nations, we are counting on more than a 1,000 excess cases of thyroid cancer amongst children. So looking at all of these facts and these, these numbers, it's important for us as doctors to state that every human being has a right to health and to life in a healthy environment. And this is our big problem, that we're seeing that this right is being taken away from people, people who are living in contaminated areas, people who are forced to eat contaminated food. So the important thing about this report is not so much counting cases of cancer or predicting, making the best prediction of how many cases of cancer there will be, but pointing out that there are people in Japan right now whose right to life in a healthy environment is being taken away from them.
Dr. Alex Rosen. Tim Mousseau, Ph.D., is a professor of biological sciences at the University of South Carolina and an on-the-ground researcher into insect and animal mutations at Chernobyl and Fukushima. I'm going to pick up where Alex left off and, and focus particularly on the impacts to environmental systems and environmental effects, uh, effects on non-human biota. You know, over the last decade or so, there's been a huge growth in the research findings published in peer-reviewed scientific journals concerning the impacts of radiation to both the plants and animal populations of both Fukushima and Chernobyl. And then some of these studies indicate really uh, an ongoing threat to the ecosystems of these regions. Studies of birds in both regions indicate declining populations stemming from the effects of radiation on reproductive ability and other diseases. Uh, recent studies of Japanese macaques suggest radiation effects on components of the monkey's blood that are similar to that previously reported for children living in Chernobyl-affected regions of Ukraine and Belarus. Uh, there have been a, a growing number of studies of insects that suggest that some groups, especially butterflies, have been negatively impacted by exposure to the radioactive contaminants. And, you know, experimental studies on these groups have been able to directly demonstrate uh, the mutagenic consequences of the exposure to radiation, and most importantly, that such mutations can be passed from one generation to the next, uh, a very important finding uh, from a, from a long-term uh, perspective. There was a recent report uh, just in the past few months on Japanese fir trees that suggest damage to growing regions that are of these trees that are very similar to those that have been found for pine trees in Chernobyl, uh, leading to this twisted and abnormal growth form that dramatically reduces the economic value of these trees. But more importantly, really, it's a bioindicator of the effects of radiation in the broader environment that really needs to be uh, reckoned with. So overall, you know, the many parallels that are now being found between the effects of both uh, radiation effects of, uh, in both Chernobyl and Fukushima provides you know, quite strong and compelling scientific evidence that the threats posed by radionuclides in the environment are real and of significant concern for the long-term sustainability of these ecosystems. This growing scientific literature stands in stark contrast to the unrealistically optimistic and, and, and to my mind, largely unsubstantiated claims by recent UNSCAR and IEA reports uh, that suggest that there would be little to no impacts to the, the Fukushima or Chernobyl biota stemming from these disasters. Clearly, the recent findings uh, contradict uh, those official positions. Really, a, a greater concern, uh, I think, is that there's this grossly inadequate investment in basic ecological research by either the Japanese government or the international community into these broader environmental effects. You know, natural systems uh, really provide a bellwether, a canary in the coal mine, as it were, for the potential long-term consequences for human populations that, you know, by necessity and government policy, continue to inhabit regions of Japan, Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, the U.S., and many other parts of the world. And, you know, these, these studies of natural biota offer so many advantages over studies of humans in that lifespans are much shorter, they can be studied in areas of much higher contamination, and they can be experimentally manipulated. Thus, effects, if any, can be observed quickly, and the mechanisms of cause and effect can be directly tested in these cases. So they really do provide an opportunity to get at the underlying mechanisms associated with uh, radiation exposure that, that are likely to be of, of great interest to issues related to human health as well. Uh, clearly, further research is warranted. Tim Musso. To learn more about his work, you can listen to Nuclear Hot Seat number 243, where he was the featured interview. Finally, we hear from Bob Alvarez, senior scholar specializing in nuclear disarmament, environmental, and energy policies for the Institute for Public Studies. He is also a former senior policy advisor to the U.S. Department of Energy. I will be speaking to the matter of land contamination and its impact on the people. The accident, uh, according to the Japanese Science Ministry, reported that long-lived radioactive cesium had contaminated about 11,580 square miles of the land surface of Japan and about 4,500 square miles, an area about almost the size of Connecticut, was found to have radiation levels that exceeded uh, U.S. exposure limits to the public by a factor of four to six. All of the land within 12 miles of the destroyed nuclear site 
encompassing an area of about 230 square miles and an additional 80 square miles located northwest of the plant were declared too radioactive for human habitation. And all the people living in these areas were evacuated in regions were declared to be permanent exclusion zones. This meant that about 160,000 people were displaced due to radioactive contamination. They cannot return. Each day now, the reactors uh, one through three, we now know that the reactor cores have melted down through the bottom of the reactor, and we currently lack the technology to even observe what is going on inside these reactors because of the intense radiation fields. They have made some progress and have been removing spent nuclear fuel from unit number four, which did not experience the kind of significant damage uh, as the other reactors. Each day, hundreds of tons of water are poured upon the melted cores, which flow into a nearby reactor turbine building, and then it's pumped through extensive cooling system, traps the radioactivity, and filters the size of small cars, which in turn become ra highly radioactive, are being placed in a nearby field. Approximately a million gallons of highly radioactive water have already been collected and are stored in the site in over 1,000 large tanks, and about 400 tons of groundwater continually flow through the damaged reactor buildings and then continue to flow into the ocean, which guarantees that the aquatic life that's used for human consumption in that immediate area will be off limits for an indefinite period of time. The economic costs of this tragedy is still being figured out, but right now the estimates for restoring the site to some restricted use, I mean, you have to consider what the site and then perhaps the largely contaminated exclusion zone may have to be considered sacrifice areas for uh, indefinite periods of time. But right now the current estimates for perhaps uh, doing remediation of the site are somewhere in a range of 50 to 100 billion dollars. Tokyo Electric Power has received about 100 billion dollars in the form of subsidies and, and payments for electrical bills from the consumer as a means to keep them afloat. The precise value of the abandoned cities, towns, agricultural lands, businesses, homes, and property located within this 310 square miles of the exclusion zone has not been established, but the total economic losses range from as high as $500 billion. Now, what does that mean? Well, the costs for the damage caused by the Hurricanes Katrina and Sandy in this country in 2005 and 2013 combined are about less than three times the amount of projected economic damage that this reactor tragedy has created. These 160,000 people who have been evicted from their homes have lost their homes and virtually all their possessions, and most have received only small compensation to cover their costs of living as evacuees, and they don't know if their homes will ever be again habitable. And areas with significantly contaminated with radioactive cesium and other long-lived radionuclides can no longer sell or export agricultural crops. So this is something that's going to become a, a new normal, unfortunately, for the people of Japan, especially in that region. Bob Alvarez. Then the phone lines were opened up to journalists. I wanted to make certain I would have a chance to ask my questions, so I jumped right in. First question comes from Libby Halevi of Nuclear Hot Seat. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hello and uh, good morning or afternoon to each of you. My question is, with the unreliability and perhaps the planned deniability of no research being done in the earliest days of the Fukushima disaster and actually for the time after that, where did you source your data? How did you collect it, and how reliable do you feel that it is, or how did you figure out the reliability of it? I think I will answer that. This is exactly one of the problems that we were facing in putting together this report, and I had briefly mentioned it. Most of the data that's available for such calculations comes from the company, uh, TEPCO, from the Japanese Atomic Energy Agency, and from the International Atomic Energy Agency. So we're very aware of, of the problem that this poses because obviously these three groups have a vested interest in nuclear energy in Japan. And 
their data, if, if we look at it, for example, the source term, meaning the total amount of radioactivity released by the nuclear catastrophe, there's several estimations on how, how large the source term actually was, on how much radioactivity was released. And the Japanese Atomic Energy Agency's estimate actually is the lowest one of them. Um, for independent research by the Norwegian Institute of Atmospheric Studies or the Austrian Central Agency for Atmospheric Studies were not taken into account. Rather, the lowest estimates by the Japanese Atomic Energy Agency was taken up by the United Nations, but also by the WHO report. Um, still, we, we went with their numbers because they were the numbers that were published internationally and are talked about. But we realized that because of these vested interests that exist from the companies that, that are supplying the data or the institutions supplying the data, the numbers that they were calculating are basically on the lower spectrum of what we can expect. And so this is uh, talked about a lot in the, in the report. And it's a good point to always ask, you know, where, where is the data coming from? And we need to take a careful look at that. And we would wish for there to be more independent research by scientists who don't, who are not under the suspicion of receiving funds uh, or belonging to the nuclear industry. But sadly, as you mentioned in your question, this data is very rare. I just may add this just as an aside. Japan is the second largest contributor to the IAEA budget to the United States. And is there any way to possibly reconstruct this information, or we have to go with the presumably low estimates that have come out as the basis for this? And even given the low nature of the source material, it still seems like it's a, a pretty terrible prognosis that you have for Japan and its people. Well, like I said, we don't uh, pretend to have better answers, but we do think that we have better questions. You know, we don't want to go into number, number meddling and taking variables and, and multiplying the risk factors in the end, coming up with outrageously high numbers that we can't prove. We'd rather take the numbers that are used by, by official institutions that they cannot prove and ask certain questions about how they came about and if they really represent the true extent. What we know is that they most probably do not represent the true extent of the health effects and that these health effects are much, much larger in scope. But even citing their official statistics, their official data, already paints a, a picture that is not too positive and a picture that, that is worrying a lot of people. So we feel that as an institution like IPP and W and PSR, uh, what we can do is ask critical questions, and this is what we're doing in our report. The answers came mostly from Dr. Alex Rosen, with a little bit there from Bob Alvarez. Having used up my question and the follow-up, I waited to see what questions would be raised by other reporters. I didn't have long to wait, because there were no other questions asked. None. In truth, there were only 13 reporters on the line, and one of them was me. I do not know if any interviews were requested by those reporters with the four experts on the panel. As for the 70-odd stories that have appeared so far in the world's media, few are in English and none came from American mainstream media. For some reason, Greece really picked up on the story, running it on 22 separate platforms. The story also ran in Senegal, Belgium, France, Switzerland, and Tunisia. Canada ran the story, but all but one of its mentions were in French. Online, it was only carried by a few blogs, the medical site Medscape.com, and the usual suspects. Dianukes, some environmental sites, and a lone mainstream posting on, of all things, the Detroit Press. I knew we were having trouble getting nuclear stories out, but one this big, with such solid documentation, coming from top world experts, with all four interviewees available for interviews after the fact, nothing. Shameful. So if you want to do your own reporting or investigating of this truly important report, 
We will have links to both the press release and the full report from PSR and IPPNW up on the website nuclearhotseat.com under this episode number 247. And I will have a little more to say on the media during today's final thought. Activist shout out. Everybody did a phenomenal job in covering and posting and reposting the stories that covered various aspects of the Fukushima story in an appropriate way. And a special shout out to Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds.org. He's back from a month traveling around Japan, having given talks, learned what's happening on the ground, and reporting back to us through a series of podcasts about various aspects of his trip. Because Arnie is so trusted by the Japanese people, he has been made privy to many telling details about life in the country since Fukushima began five years ago. You can find his videos, audios, articles, blog posts, and links to his radio appearances at fairwinds.org, and it's spelled F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S dot org. Welcome back, Arnie. Now, throw out the shoes you wore on the ground near Fukushima and use a radiation meter on your clothing and suitcase to make certain you didn't bring home any unwanted souvenirs. Your good works alone will not protect your health, and we need you. Here's today's final thought. The glut of articles about Fukushima in the media in the past week to ten days, many of them accurate and positive towards the struggles of the Japanese people, may seem like a major shift in media coverage, but it's an anniversary spike with probably no staying power. As my experience with the PSR IPPNW press conference vividly demonstrates, most news organizations, at least the ones here in the U.S., are not interested in ongoing coverage of Fukushima or, indeed, any nuclear story that does not scream immediate potential danger, such as the recent radiation spikes in the water at Indian Point in New York or Turkey Point in Florida. Worse, now that Fukushima's fifth anniversary is over, it's going to be a very long time until we get even a fraction of the media play. That's because mainstream media has an unspoken algorithm they follow after any disaster. Check it out. Immediately after any disaster happens, there is saturation news coverage wall to wall. But in less than a week, that dissolves into news roundups with a soft feature filling in the space. Features extend in an irregular pattern until about three weeks after the event has occurred. Then there will be one feature story every week to ten days, usually dealing with government officials and their promises or threats, tapering off to a roundup of information at three months and six months. Then at the one-year anniversary mark, there's a lot of play. Year two anniversary, eh, somewhat less. Years three and four, some mentions, usually by that point totally skewed by spin. Year five is again the big one, as you've just seen by the deluge of commemorative pieces, features, TV and mainstream media coverage. Whether it was good or not is another question, but at least it was there. And, of course, there were more than the usual share of pro-nuke spin pieces, too. But at this point, the coverage will be coming in five-year intervals. The years between are not likely to stir up more than an occasional brief mention. Remember, news is news. And nothing is so dull to the media as yet another old commemorative piece on whatever it was that happened that changed our lives way back when. Journalism, my once chosen profession, disappoints me with its lack of persistence of vision, its convenient amnesias, and the under-the-table laziness of taking brokered press releases and running them as if they're genuine news stories. The fifth state ain't what it used to be. The online presences, the blogs and podcasts and Facebook posters and Twitter tweeters, it's up to us to keep the accurate information circulating. 
So when you see an article, program, video, blog, anything that speaks truth to power about nuclear, help us get it up and out. Send it to your friends and family. Put it on your email list or database. Link to it on your website. Do what you can to spread the truth about what's happening. And don't think that your contribution does not count, because trust me, it does. The people of Japan need and deserve our support. And we need to do this to support each other in all the rest of the nuclear nightmare stories that swirl around, virtually invisible to the general public, as they silently take down our health and safety. For all of you who are already doing what you can to get the word out, thank you. I'm sure glad to be in community with you. Now, let's see what we can do to wake up the rest of the world and not have to wait for the 10-year anniversary of Fukushima to get the word out. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, March 15, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, psr.org, ippnw.org, Japan Times, zmescience.com, Associated Press, globalnews.ca, asahi.com, apjjf.org, publications.parliament.uk, nbcbayarea.com, rt.com, npr.org, stlewis.cbslocal.com, chinapost.com, nuclear-news.net, and Sean McGee, gulfnews.com, ndtv.com, ctvnews.ca, vancouversun.com, dianukes.org, miningawareness.wordpress.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the soul-sucked zombies who gave up on the great American novel to write for World Nuclear News, and the gold standard of activists who hang out at the Nuclear Hot Seat site on Facebook, which you, yes you, are all invited to visit and like. And a reminder that if you go to the Nuclear Hot Seat website and sign up for the free chapter of my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, that will place you in our database and you will get notification of each week's episode as an email. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV on StuWebRadioNetwork.com, in New Zealand by NewsZSentinel.com, and ActivateMedia.org. We are always on the lookout for other networks to connect with, so if you know a news aggregator, a community radio station, heck, I'd go for cable or satellite. If you have connections to any of these and they would like to carry the show, do put us in touch. Check out the archive of over 245 shows on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com. Many of them are up on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and they're also available on iTunes. And remember, your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force for honest, accurate nuclear news that it is. So please do what you can this week to help us out with the donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. That's name and website. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now, don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.